to this year's Gender Equality Index Conference. Coming to you live from Brussels, Vilnius, and offices around Europe. Today, we will get the updated scores for gender equality in the EU. Has gender equality gone forward or taken a step backwards? Which country will win the award for most improved? What's driving progress and what's holding us back? Get ready. We are moments away from revealing the results. Good morning and welcome to the launch event for the Gender Equality Index for 2021. My name is Jack Parrock. I'm here in our studio in Brussels and I'll be hosting this event from here. But we obviously also have our two studios in Vilnius who are going to be joining us throughout the day. This is an event hosted by the European, uh, the European Institute for Gender Equality who are launching the index annually and because of that you can use the hashtag if you're on social media if you're posting about the index if you're commenting on our event anywhere on social media you can use the hashtag Iger index e-i-g-e-i-n-d-e-x we love to be able to for you to use that hashtag so that we can follow everything that you're talking about online. Now, you're going to be watching us probably on the platform for the event. That is a very nifty little platform where you're going to be able to ask questions to our panelists and to our, uh, the people who are joining our discussions. And you're also going to be able to click like on other people's questions if you're interested in them being answered. So I'd encourage you to go across the platform, use as many of the tools and techniques that they've got up there. We also have a meet and match function which is going to allow you all to connect with one another participants of the event as well. Obviously we're still uh, not able to have the sort of big in-person events uh, that we'd like to have yet but this is an opportunity for you to connect with other people that are following the event throughout the day. Now, uh, I'd also like to just take a moment to thank the people that are going to be doing our sign language throughout the whole of the event. That will be everything that comes out of the studio here in Brussels and the two parallel sessions in Vilnius as well. So thank you to our, to our interpreters. Uh, the Vilnius team are standing by. We have Raza Tapanin and Alexandrina Satnoyanu who are going to be hosting the two parallel sessions later on in the day. So it's worth using the platform to take a look at exactly which one of those parallel sessions you would like to join. So uh, that's, uh, the way our event is going to work is we're going to have an opening uh, session with some high level speeches. We're then going to release and launch the results of the Gender Equality Index for this year. Following that, we're going to have a panel session here in Brussels. After that, we'll have a short break before splitting off into our three panel sessions, and then we'll return for something of a closing ceremony. Okay, so that's how the event's going to work, but without further ado, we are going to hear from Carly and Sheila, who's the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality, and she's going to give us her opening remarks. Good morning from Brussels and welcome to the Gender Equality Index 2021. Thank you for joining us from wherever you are today. We at the European Institute for Gender Equality, AIGE, are looking forward to hosting you for the next few hours. Today we release the sixth edition of our Gender Equality Index. Since we started measuring gender equality in the EU, we have collected almost a decade's worth of data. This allows us to see how much each country has progressed 
or indeed regressed, when it comes to equality between women and men in recent history. With all this data, we can also track the impact of policy choices over the years. Because we look at every aspect of gender equality, from how much women and men earn at work, to who sits on the boards of Europe's biggest companies, we can see quite clearly where the actions of policymakers have made a difference. Each year, we also take an in-depth look at one burning policy issue in particular. This lets us analyze women's and men's different experiences in forensic detail and to try to paint a picture of what the future holds. This year, after more than a year and a half of the COVID pandemic, our special focus is, of course, on health. The moment the pandemic hit, IGE started gathering data on how gender affects people's health, as well as their access to health services. We are particularly grateful to the European Commission's Directorate for Justice and Consumers and the Directorate for Health, as well as the World Health Organization, all of whom helped us a great deal in our research. We looked at infection, mortality, and long-term consequences of the virus, of course, but in particular we focused on women's and men's different experiences of mental and sexual and reproductive health. Today, we are ready to share our findings with you. I don't want to give too much away, and you will hear more in our panels later, but there are some things that really jumped out at me. For example, when it comes to mental health, we can see the harmful impact of gender stereotypes. Men often do not seek help when they need to, with tragic consequences. Young women develop eating disorders because they are surrounded by unachievable images of what a woman's body should look like. When it comes to sexual and reproductive health, schools are still leaving out important topics like consent in their sexuality classes. Men are less involved in family planning and contraceptive use than women are. Of course, Europe is diverse, and my experience will not be the same as all other women, just as not all men's experiences are the same. People who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans or intersex can feel unable to disclose their identity to their healthcare professionals and are sometimes even denied treatment. Women who have undergone female genital mutilation can face humiliating experiences with health, healthcare staff who have not been trained to deal with cases such as theirs. And with COVID, we are facing new challenges. In some countries, women have struggled to access contraceptives and other reproductive health services, such as abortions. Social isolation and financial worries have also created a mental health crisis that is sure to outlast the pandemic. There is a worry that a pause on counselling programmes to combat female genital mutilation will cause a jump in cases over the coming years. While our Gender Equality Index scores do not yet reflect these realities, our analysis shows that we are already registering some big losses for gender equality. Again, you will hear more over the course of the day, but it is important to remember that progress is not unstoppable. Already before the crisis, we saw women's rights and equality starting to be rolled back in some countries. That's why I would like to thank you again 
for coming today to speak about how we can prevent this backsliding and how we can keep moving forward to finally achieve gender equality. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carleen, for your opening comments there. Now, moving on, we're going to hear from Helena Dali, who is the European Commissioner for Equality. She made this statement, she's making this statement on the launch of the Gender Equality Index for this year. Caroline Criado Perez wrote in her book, Invisible Women, that if I were to ask you to picture someone in the throes of a heart attack, you most likely would think of a man in his late middle age, possibly overweight, clutching at his heart in agony. That's certainly what a Google image search offers up. Still today, healthcare and health policies too often ignore the gender dimension and intersectional approach needed to design adequate policies and treatments for everyone. The lack of gender awareness in medical research, treatments and data has led to incorrect diagnosis and follow-up, lack of recognition of gender differences and symptoms such as heart attacks, and inadequate attention by the healthcare system to invisible illnesses such as depression and eating disorders. This increases the vulnerability and risks among some groups such as older women, women with disabilities, women of migrant backgrounds, and LGBTIQ people. Even in the most robust of healthcare systems, access to treatments and services have been put at risk due to the pandemic. In particular, women and girls struggled with accessing menstrual hygiene information and supplies because of school closures, mobility restrictions, and economic distress. School closures have also hindered young people's access to vital, comprehensive sex education, which could potentially lead to increases in teenage and unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, or unhealthy and violent relations. In some member states, even before the COVID-19 crisis emerged, girls and young women faced significant barriers in accessing essential sexual and reproductive health information and services. While reference to sexual and reproductive health and rights is often linked to abortion, issues such as contraception, education, prevention, treatment of HIV and other sexually transmitted diseases, as well as fertility, hormonal therapies and sex-specific cancers are also key dimensions. Addressing today's topic comes at a timely moment as the biggest global health crisis we have experienced continues to highlight existing gender inequalities. Women make up 72% of healthcare professionals in the EU. They are often in lower paid positions while putting their own health at risk to serve others, not only as nurses and midwives, but also as health support and care workers. However, Women remain underrepresented in managerial and decision-making positions in the healthcare sector. Eurofound research demonstrates that women's mental health has been disproportionately affected during the pandemic. Among the main stressors for women is the increased burden of ensuring business continuity with ongoing care and schooling responsibilities from home. There has also been an exponential rise in women's exposure to domestic violence, while pressure from working on the front line of healthcare provision has contributed to growing mental health issues. All this confirms that integrating the gender perspective is crucial for effective healthcare policy and services, as health is a critical area for the promotion of gender equality. The Commission remains committed to doing its part. As stated in the EU Gender Equality Strategy, the EU for Health Strategy and the European Pillar of Social Rights Action Plan. Ensuring universal access to appropriate, affordable and quality healthcare for everyone remains a priority for the EU.
I thank Eige for their work as the key findings of the 2021 edition of the index will remain valuable indicators for pushing forward on the Commission's gender equality and gender mainstreaming actions in health. Thank you so much, Commissioner Dali, for that speech to mark the launch of the Gender Equality Index for 2021. I think it was clear from what she was saying how pervasive and how widespread the effects of the pandemic have been on so many issues of our life, but obviously on gender equality as well. Now we're going to hear from Yanis sigler Kral. He is the Minister of Labour, Family, Social Affairs and Equal Opportunities of Slovenia, the country currently holding the rolling presidency of the EU Council. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to have the possibility to address you today, even though virtually. The equality between women and men is a fundamental value of the European Union. It is crucial to put gender equality at the heart of the post-pandemic recovery. We can do so by actively pursuing the goals set in the Europe Action Plan for the European Pillar of Social Rights. The Action Plan should be our guide for strengthening the social rights that support gender equality by adopting gender-sensitive national recovery and resilience plans where possible. We should also follow the Gender Equality Strategy 2020 to 2025, which represents a good strategic framework to achieve progress regarding women's rights and gender equality, not only at the European, but also at the national levels, respectively. The European Institute for Gender Equality plays an extremely important role in advancing and supporting informed decision-making in this area. AJ, flagship product, that uh, Gender Equality Index has become an essential tool for the member states and the EU decision makers, helping to monitor progress on gender equality across the Union. I welcome the effort that AJ puts in ensuring a steady supply of fresh data. This year's focus on health is by all means of great value. The pandemic has changed all aspects of our lives. Moreover, it has highlighted the pre-existing challenges and deepened the inequalities between women and men in almost all areas of life. This has been particularly tough on women who have often found themselves at the front line of the pandemic. In the background of the global public health and economic turmoil of the pandemic lurks another crisis, the rising rates of violence against women. Unfortunately, we see that the frequent physical distancing requirements have resulted in a greater participation in the virtual world, where cyber violence, including against women and girls, is on the rise. Therefore, during our presidency, we also addressed the issue of cyber violence at a high level webinar on combating cyber violence against women and girls. The webinar will highlight the political commitment to effectively, effectively address the prevent cyber violence and harassment against women and girls, also in the light of pandemic. I would like to highlight that now more than ever, we have to invest in robust and resilient health systems. We have to support essential workers, such as health by social workers, by ensuring safe working conditions, providing appropriate equipment, establishing conditions for decent and fair payment, offering professional development, and ensuring access to services such as childcare and mental health services. This crisis has revealed that gender is among the crucial indicators determining whether a person recovers from a crisis unharmed or whether they could have several aspects of their life overturned. It is our duty and responsibility as policymakers to ensure that the differing and yet interlinked needs of people, regardless of gender, are taken into account in the COVID-19 response. By taking action now, we can be better prepared for the next crisis to come. 
and by building a more inclusive and just society, we can ensure that we are more resilient to future challenges. I wish you a successful event. Thank you. Thank you so much to Minister Sigler Kral for that speech for us. Now, moving on, we're going to hear from Hans Henry P. Kluger, who is the director of the World Health Organization's regional office for Europe, who's making this statement as we launch the Gender Equality Index for 2021. Dear friends and colleagues, my sincere thanks to Director Schele and the staff of the European Institute for Gender Equality, to Commissioner Dali and DG Just, and to DG Santé, for our ongoing collaboration and your commitment to gender equality. COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on women and girls. It has exacerbated existing inequalities and placed a disproportionate burden on women, including in healthcare settings. Women are more present in services impacted by lockdowns and are more often responsible for homeschooling. The demand for unpaid childcare has fallen primarily on women, constraining their ability to take unpaid work. It is still women who are disproportionately responsible for the bulk of domestic tasks and the care of children and the elderly. Gender-based violence was pervasive before this pandemic hit. Reporting of violence against women has increased during COVID-19, while access to essential services has been restricted. In healthcare, the gender pay gap is 25%, higher than in other sectors. Women health workers are clustered into lower status, lower paid roles. Although they make up 70% of the health workforce, they hold only 25% of senior roles. Women health workers are faced with increased workloads, shortages of personal protective equipment, harassment, violence. In short, COVID-19 has exposed and amplified existing gender inequalities in our region and jeopardized recent gains. The index being launched today, to which WHO provided technical support, is a powerful tool for change. But there are still considerable data gaps within and beyond the European Union. For the simple reason that healthcare is not gender neutral, WHO continues to urge its 53 member states to collect and disaggregate COVID-19 data by sex, age and other factors to ensure inclusive, effective pandemic response and recovery. As spelled out in recent WHO guidance on the importance of gender statistics, quote, a lack of gender integration in health information systems will hold governments back from responding effectively, costing resources and lives, unquote. As a matter of fact, this time last year, out of 183 countries globally, only eight had sex disaggregated data on COVID-19 testing and 21 on hospitalizations. Getting our hands on the data is one thing. Analyzing and using it to guide inclusive pandemic response and recovery efforts is another. WHO's commitment is clear. To advance gender equality in health in the context of the pandemic, we have three priorities. One, to reduce the severe socio-economic impact of COVID-19 on women. This means that their economic participation needs to increase and the pay gap must be addressed through investing in health and social care jobs with fair pay and recognition. Two, to ensure that women take part in national, 
regional and local decision making on COVID-19 prevention and control. The Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, the Monti Commission, has a clear recommendation that in any emergency committee, more than 50% of the people participating should be women. And third, to enhance social support, prevention, early detection and treatment for women at risk of domestic violence, and to address the mental health impact of the virus and prevent health worker burnout. A priority for me. As I mentioned, I had established the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development. And it has issued its final report, called Drawing Light from the Pandemic. It clearly calls for eliminating the gender gap in the health sector. This is not only about rectifying long-standing gender inequalities. This is about women as health leaders. About gendered responses to crisis. This is about equality and women's protection that must be placed at the heart of any crisis response. I myself, as the WHO Regional Director for Europe, I am walking the talk. One of my campaign commitments was more than 50% in my executive team to be women. I kept my word. To conclude, let us consider that although the virus has exposed systemic and societal flaws, it has also provided a window of opportunity for changing course. A opportunity of fixing the fractures in society as we rebuild back forward. Global health should be led and delivered by everyone, to everyone, not just by and to a chosen few. Thank you and I wish you strong health. Thank you so much to Hans-Henry P. Kluger for that speech and to all of our high-level uh, statements who've launched this event for us, who've come in with a lot of the things that we're going to talk about through our panels later on. I remind you that if you're talking about the Gender Equality Index online on any social media platforms, please use the hashtag IGEINDEX, E-I-G-E, I-N-D-E-X, and that'll allow us to continue to have the conversation. And also a reminder that you can use the platform for the event to drop in your questions. Now, before we start having our panel events, this is the moment. Here is the time to launch the Gender Equality Index for 2021. Take a look. What is the Gender Equality Index? AGA's Gender Equality Index measures the progress of gender equality in the European Union. It shows gender equality trends in the domains of work, money, knowledge, time, power, health, and violence. Each year, the Gender Equality Index scores the EU and the member states from 1 to 100. A score of 100 would mean that a country has reached full equality between women and men. The index also looks at intersecting inequalities, which considers the situation of different groups of women and men based on family type, level of education, country of birth, age, and disability. Each year, the index has a thematic focus. This time, we are taking an in-depth look at health and gender equality. As Europe looks for ways to recover from the economic, social and public health consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic that have affected the lives of women and men all across the European Union, we hope that our index findings will inspire Europe's leaders to design solutions that are inclusive and promote gender equality in our societies. The moment to reveal this year's scores for the Gender Equality Index is here. The European Union's score for gender equality is 68 points 
out of 100. This is a tiny increase of 0.6 points from last year's edition and a mere 4.9 points since 2010. There are big variations in gender equality scores between countries, from 83.9 points in Sweden to 52.5 points in Greece. Sweden, Denmark and the Netherlands are Europe's top performers this year. Sweden and Denmark have held on to their top position since last year, while the Netherlands has jumped two spots to gain third place. This caused France and Finland to each drop one spot in the rankings to fourth and fifth place, respectively. Since last year's edition, Luxembourg, Lithuania and the Netherlands have improved the most, with a gain of around two points. These changes have been mostly driven by improvements in decision-making, especially due to better gender balance on company boards. Slovenia was the only country that went backwards in its overall index score since last year, losing points in the area of decision-making. Ten member states scored lower than 60 points in this year's Gender Equality Index, with Greece, Hungary and Romania struggling the most. These three countries face major challenges with gender equality in decision-making, as well as in the domain of work and time. When we look at progress trends between 2010 and 2019, we see that index scores have increased by more than 8.5 points for Luxembourg, Malta, Italy, Austria and Portugal. In Estonia, France, Cyprus, Ireland, Spain, Croatia, Latvia and Germany, index uh, score increases ranged between 6 and 8.2 points. Generally, countries with lower levels of gender equality have been progressing faster, while the growth in top performing countries has been much slower. Let's take a closer look to see where the EU is performing best in gender equality and where improvements are needed. The EU is farthest away from gender equality in the domain of power, which focuses on decision making and it is the lowest scoring domain in the index. However, this is also the domain which has improved the most since 2010. These changes have largely been driven by improvements in economic and political decision-making. This is because more women are taking up decision-making positions on company boards and in politics, a trend we have observed in recent editions of the index. In 2021, 30% of board members of the largest publicly listed companies in member states are women. Outstanding developments in seven member states following the introduction of quotas has fueled most of the progress. At the current rate of change, countries with binding quotas will take around four years to achieve boardroom gender parity. But for countries that take no action, it will take more than 125 years to reach gender parity in boardrooms. In large companies, women account for less than 1 in 10 board presidents or CEOs. There's still a long way to go. The results from this year's Gender Equality Index show fragile gains in gender equality. However, the big losses that Europe has suffered as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic put even these gains at risk. As part of this year's index report, we have looked at the fallout from the pandemic, and this is what we found. The economic fallout from the COVID-19 crisis will last longer for women. After years of growth across the EU, employment has declined for both women and men since the start of the pandemic. Jobs losses were highly concentrated in sectors where women make up the majority of the workforce, such as retail, accommodation, residential care, domestic work, and clothing manufacturing. Most of these sectors did not recover throughout 2020. Although employment rates started to rise last summer, men were twice as likely than women to get back to jobs. 
showing that the negative economic impact of the COVID crisis will affect women longer than it will affect men. The COVID-19 pandemic made women more vulnerable to income loss. The risk of poverty or social exclusion was already higher for women than for men in the EU before the pandemic, and the COVID-19 crisis is likely to make the situation even worse. While all member states adopted measures to help those who lost jobs or weren't earning during the pandemic or weren't earning very much, these kinds of measures were less likely to reach women. That's because women are more likely to work in sectors that offer lower benefits and are less likely to meet the eligibility criteria for government support. School closures reinforce inequality in education and unpaid work. As schools and universities rapidly shifted to digital learning, girls and boys from lower social economic backgrounds often lacked internet access and acquired a room to study. The transition to remote learning was challenging for all – teachers, students and parents alike. Children in primary schools needed a high degree of parental involvement in online schooling, creating extra unpaid work as well as work-life balance conflicts for parents, especially mothers. During the pandemic, unpaid care increased, especially for lone mothers. While time spent on care duties increased for all parents during the pandemic, the impact has been huge on mothers of children under 12 and lone mothers, expanding existing gender inequalities in the responsibilities of unpaid care. On the flip side, the beginning of the pandemic led to a modest increase in time spent by men on unpaid care, especially fathers who lost their jobs or whose partner was an essential worker. The pandemic reminded us that we need more women in important decision-making positions. Although women make up around 70% of health professionals, this majority does not carry over into leadership positions in the healthcare sector. During the pandemic and until March 2021, only one in four ministers of health in the EU were women. Women were also largely left out of the COVID-19 task forces that were set up in all countries to tackle the pandemic. When this happened, there was a risk that women's needs were left out of the solutions designed to address the pandemic. Due to COVID-19, life expectancy dropped, especially for men. This drop is related to higher fatalities to the virus and higher excess mortality for men in most EU countries. Birth rates also dropped. Psychological distress, economic uncertainty and an increase in unpaid care work for women led couples to delay having children or to decide not to have them at all. The effects of the pandemic also took a heavy toll on mental health. Lockdowns led to loneliness. More care and household work caused parents, especially lone mothers, to burn out. As the special focus of this year's index is health, we'll be diving deeper into the impact of COVID on these issues during our breakout sessions. Do stay tuned to find out more. Restrictions on mobility and increased isolation exposed women to a higher risk of intimate partner violence during the lockdowns. For victims of violence, their legal and social support networks were shattered or, in some cases, never existed, making it very difficult or impossible to seek immediate support or to escape from home. For older women, the lockdowns exacerbated the factors which put them at risk of violence, social isolation and loneliness, mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, and financial dependency. So, what needs to be done to ensure that we build back better and keep advancing gains in gender equality? It's clear that pre-existing gender inequalities, such as in the labor market and in the provision of care, have shaped the pandemic's impact on people's health and well-being as well as their livelihoods. If we want to recover from this pandemic 
gender equality must be at the core of recovery measures. This is crucial to strengthen the resilience of our society and improve the life of every woman and man in the European Union. Here is what we need. Recovery strategies that are designed to equally benefit women and men. National gender equality bodies should work with the national structures responsible for COVID-19 recovery efforts to ensure that gender mainstreaming tools are used throughout the recovery. Gender impact assessments would help policymakers estimate how recovery strategies will affect women and men differently. And gender budgeting would help ensure women and men benefit equally from government spending. The COVID crisis has not been gender neutral. Recovery efforts can't be either. If gender inequalities are not taken into account, we are at risk of losing the fragile gains we have made in gender equality over recent years. We need to invest more in the health and care sector. From nurses in intensive care units to those providing professional care in people's homes, it was predominantly women on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. These jobs deserve respect and not through clapping, but through better pay and working conditions. Improving the condition and status of care work would also attract more men to these jobs, which are critical for the future of Europe. Last but not least, we need governments to tackle gender-based violence in crisis times as part of their long-term gender equality strategies. Member states need to be ready before disaster strikes. They need to pass new legislation, introduce digital ways of helping victims, and fund organizations that support women facing violence. The police, justice, social, and health sectors need to be coordinated so that victims get the essential assistance they need in time. Next year's index will reveal the longer socio-economic consequences of the pandemic on gender equality. You can find all our index-related materials on AGES website. Compare the results for each country, view the report and explore the data. Follow hashtag AGEindex on social media for more updates. So there we have it. The results of the Gender Equality Index for 2021 are out. As you heard, you can go to the website uh, and that you can access through the platform to find out more about the different country-specific numbers. That headline number that we saw that the, across the European Union, gender equality has incrementally just reached 68 out of 100 with an improvement of 0.6. Now, we're going to try and unpack a lot of the details, a lot of the information that the index shows us. We're going to do that firstly with a panel here, here in the studio in Brussels, and then later on uh, in our event, we're going to split off into some parallel sessions. So without further ado, let's start launching our first panel. This is going to be on how we can put gender equality at the core of Europe's uh, COVID-19 recovery. So now here are the guests for this panel. We have with us Dragos Pizlari, who's a member of the European Parliament from Romania. We also have Alba Gonzalez Sanz, an advisor to the Spanish Minister for Equality. We have Maria Teresa Fabregas Fernandez, who's a director for, Euro uh, for recovery and resilience uh, in the task force of the European Commission. And we have Dr. Natasha Azapadi Muscat, the director for the Division of Country Health Policies and System Systems in the World Health Organization's Regional Office 
for Europe. Thank you so much, all of you, for being with us here to launch the Gender Equality Index for 2021. So the way this panel is going to work, we're going to allow you a moment to give your first reactions, each of you, to the Gender Equality Index, and then we'll have more of a debate about exactly how we can ensure that the recovery that the European Union is intending to do from the COVID-19 pandemic, how that is focused and, and promotes gender equality. So first, we'll turn to you, Dragos Pizlari. Thank you so much for being with us. I wonder if you can tell us what you make of the in index, a small incremental gain across the European Union. What needs to happen more and how do we make sure we recover better? <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and uh, allow me to begin by saying a big thank you uh, to everyone participating in today's event and to those who have made it possible, EIG, uh, and I mean, all the volunteers and the interpreters. Um, I mean, because not only it is a very timely subject due to the current pandemic, but a very necessary one in, in, for an inclusive and sustainable growth of our societies. I, I am particularly honored to open this pan panel and I salute the, my, my co-panelists. Uh, my major part of my activity in the European Parliament so far has been centered on, on the will to create a more inclusive society and a prosperous future for us all. I mean, it's what I'm actually uh, been doing each day, I, what I fought for during the negotiations as a co-rapporteur of the RF, what I envisaged to my work as coordinator in the European Parliament's Committee on Employment and Social Affairs, and what I actually promote through all my activities as a politician, as an economist, as a husband and a father of four children. Uh, this very slow progress in achieving full gender equality has implications for the lives and life chances for all women, girls, boys and men of all the communities we live in and for the EU as a whole. And we are all aware of the importance social inclusion and equality play uh, in, in thriving society. Yet we, we, we are very slow in our progress, but by not offering the same opportunities to everyone. And we will all benefit from a society where everyone has access to education and equal chances, where everyone is able to decide what is best for themselves without stereotypes and social pressure imposing certain direction or timelines. However, unfortunately, we are not there yet. And uh, as I see it, uh, the report on gender equality index presented today shows that the COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated the already existing inequalities in our society. And the response, uh, as a response to these new challenges, we managed to launch the largest EU financial instrument ever created by the EU, the RRF, Recovery and Resilience Facility, about which I'm looking forward to discussing with you in this uh, particular panel in the context of finding effective measures for alleviating the burden and the pandemic has put on our goal of eliminating gender-based inequalities. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll get into the recovery fund that the EU's put together and how we can use that a little, a little bit more as we as we go through the panel. Thank you so much, Dragos. So moving on now to to Alba, are you? Uh, how do you feel about the results of the Gender Equality Index? Are you are you pleased? I mean, there is improvement. Uh, how does it feel for you working in a ministry for equality in a country like Spain? <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Jack. Good morning to you all. Thanks to the authorities, the organization, and of course, uh, our co-panelists. Um, the annual publication of this index is, in fact, very important for us. It's a, a key milestone because it, it helps us to see better if um, the policies we are developing are in a good way or, or which are the fields which uh, we need to improve more. So every year we, we consider this, this tool as an important way to see uh, um, how it's going, uh, this uh, fight for gender equality and, and the fields we need to, to improve. Uh, we think this is a very important year because the world is still immersed in this critical situation due to the pandemic and the challenge for equality between women and men is one of the key elements to get out of this health and socioeconomic crisis in, in, our, in our view. Um, we think that this health emergency has so that uh, public services, car services, as, as it had been said uh, during the presentation, that traditionally assume women uh, in a overwhelming way are essential and and are needed to a fair redistribution uh, i think we think in fact from the from the minister that no catastrophe has a positive elements but however this crisis um, has shown us these contradictions uh, this unjust system and also uh, not only governments or institutions but the feminist movement uh, experts activists have been warning of those structural inequalities that um, truly impede democracy in fact and i think covid19 confirmed 
all these hypotheses and, and make us a more clear view on what we need to do. And we need to improve this gender equality, this equality between women and men to struggle and to recover. And I think uh, for the European Fund, um, this, this must be also uh, a key issue, this uh, gender mainstreaming to, to finally say that we can achieve gender equality and also um, a world that uh, never came back to, to the situation we have lived uh, now, we are living now. Thank you. Thank you, Alba. So now we'll turn to you, Maria Theresa, from, from the European Commission. Welcome and thank you for, for being with us. I wonder your, your initial reactions to the, to the index results and also, uh, you know, how, how, the, how important it is for the Commission to be able to see these kind of numbers in order to, to, to go forward, especially when we're looking at the, at the recovery. Thank you. Good morning to you all. So uh, the figures show that there is still a lot of work to, to be done. It's clear that the European Commission is fully committed to achieving uh, a union of equality. And for that, we have uh, several initiatives uh, ongoing and in particular the uh, gender equality strategy. But um, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, as mentioned by the, the two previous panelists, is a key uh, element in order to move forward, move a step forward in this area. It's true that uh, equality is not a specific criteria for the assessment of the plans. However, equality considerations feature prominently in the plan because we from the European Commission, we have consistently encouraged member states to strengthen the plans, to contribute to uh, gender equality and equal opportunities. In this regard, and we will talk later about that, uh, there are uh, specific measures uh, related to uh, gender equality, but there are other measures that can also contribute to improve the situation. Here, uh, just to highlight also that um, in the framework of the European semester, the country-specific recommendations that have been addressed to specific member states related to gender equality have been a good basis for those member states to include uh, relevant reforms and investments in the plans. What is clear is that the plans are the design, huh? are the plans designing the reforms and investments, but we need to make sure that they are implemented. Huh? And for that, uh, what uh, we are counting on is on a very inclusive uh, monitoring process of the implementation of the measures, also expecting that member states involve civil society, NGOs actively in uh, the fields of non-discrimination, fundamental rights, in the implementation of some of the reforms and investments in those plans. In addition, and this is a feature in the regulation, there are reporting tools that will help uh, the European Commission through scoreboard, uh, through common indicators, to assess the progress in implementation of those reforms and investments with a link to gender equality. But we will develop all this later. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria Theresa. Yeah, we're going to talk about these plans. I mean, a number of them have been actually uh, presented today. We expect that finance ministers of the European Union will, will give the sign off to a couple more of the plans. The fund was put together, obviously, after the pandemic and allowed the European Commission to access money on the international markets. And that's why it's so important that Maria Theresa is here. She can explain a little bit more about what that means. And each country put, submits their plan in order to describe exactly what they want to do with that money. And it's, it's a way that we can, we can uh, look at using funding in order to enhance gender equality. So now we'll turn to you, uh, N Natasha, Dr. N Dr. N um, I've lost you. Dr. Uh, Natasha, thank you so much for being with us from the WHO. Um, for you, what, what do you make of the, uh, the index? Uh, you, do you think there needs to be, obviously there needs to be more work done, but what's the WHO doing to try and encourage funding to be used in order to improve gender equality? Thank you very much and I would like to thank the European Institute for Gender Equality for inviting me to speak but also for the work that has gone into the production of this index which of course is very important for us as the WHO Regional Office for Europe this year because of the thematic focus on health and there is truly a window of opportunity at the moment as health has risen to the top of the political agenda in order to ensure that we can also use this as a chance to make 
improvements in terms of gender equality. Why? Let's say that uh, although traditionally health perhaps as a domain is one of the areas that does rather well in terms of this index, sometimes we mask certain areas that are important, such as mental health, sexual and reproductive health, two domains that have suffered considerably during the past 18 months and where we see heightened gender inequalities. And I'm really glad that these issues will be covered in the thematic breakout sessions later today. What have we done? One of the most important things we have done is to convene the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, which brought together a number of world leaders, not only from the area of health, but also from other areas, including from finance. In fact, this was chaired by Senator Mario Monti. And the Commission made seven overarching objectives. And in one of these objectives, which is about healing the fractures in society, the structural inequalities that have been deepened and worsened by the pandemic, they call specifically to ensure that information systems capture inequalities in health, including gender inequalities, and also to eliminate the gender gap in leadership, as has been referred to by um, the video and by other panelists, the importance of having women really leading. And this brings me to another important point that I would like to make at the outset, which is about the health workforce. WHO already pre-pandemic had issued an important report, healthcare delivered by women and led by men. And of course, the past months, we have seen a huge strain and burnout on our frontline health workers, who are mostly women, on carers in long-term homes, again, who are mostly women. And this year, WHO has marked 2021 as the year of the health and care workforce, with three key objectives, invest, protect, together. And we really would like to take the opportunity around also the launch and the awareness of this index to highlight the need to improve the working conditions for the health workforce, which is predominantly made up of women. But of course, we also need to understand that when we are putting a focus on health and health inequalities, so much of health is actually determined very much by the social determinants. It was for this reason that we have actually brought together our work on gender in our center of excellence in the office region on investing in health with a focus on the social determinants of health. Because if we really want to make progress, then we have to ensure that we talk, yes, about jobs, about poverty, about the structural and social determinants of health that often keep women behind. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. Yeah, I think it was very interesting. One of the things that, that, that stood out to me uh, as, the, as the index was being launched was the fact that men are twice as likely to get their job back if they lost it from the pandemic and what that means uh, going forward as we try to improve the situation. So let's turn now specifically to the recovery fund. This fund of money that the European Union now has at its disposal, the countries are going to be, be, be able to implement their plans. We'll come back to you, Dragosh. The European Commission, uh, it, well, we don't know, but the European Parliament at least is saying that it's going to be very difficult to try and enforce countries to abide by rule of law as part of the, uh, as part of the, the money that they're going to get out of this big fund. How difficult is it going to be to make member states use this money to improve gender quality, equality as well? Yeah, so, so let's, let's start with the positive part. So the positive part is then uh, that the European Parliament in the negotiation was very keen in promoting the principle of gender equality. Um, and we, uh, we've been asking for it as, a, as an evaluation criteria. We did not get that because that's the negotiation process. Uh, you need to compromise. But what is important is that we have right now the first financial instrument of the EU that specifically asked the member states to explain 
how the measures financed by the Arab will apply the principle of gender equality. And, and I would say that, that uh, for, for, for the historical dimension of the uh, RRF, that this is really, really important. I mean, we, we did have, uh, you know, um, we, 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 we needed to do the ex ante um, explanations for the uh, structural and cohesion funds in the past. But right now, this is required to explain how the measures will apply the principle of gender equality. And, and I think that this is uh, thanks to the efforts and the ambition of the European Parliament and then Team Europe together with the Council and, and the European Commission. And that's very, very important. Now, I mean, the investments that we had in mind for the RF were measures supporting and empowering women. And, and that's actually crucial. And um, I, I mean, we, we, can, we can look through it. And, and there are several things that we can, we can think. I mean, for instance, uh, several member states like Austria, Italy, and Germany, just to name a few of them, have included measures in their national recovery and resilience plans, such as increasing capacity of nurseries, creation, renovation of childcare facilities, developing screening programs for the early detection of factors during a pregnancy. Um, so these are things that are really focusing on the main topic of, of this year's uh, index, that is health and gender equality. And, and, and I think that this is a very good thing. However, you know, in order to, for the structural gender equality to be eliminated on the long term, the empowerment of women has to come from, from all angles, starting from education opportunities, lifelong learning, mental and physical health, uh, health and labor marking allowing to greater flexibility and adjusting better to equal opportunities and and indeed we we can see the preference of women to teleworking we 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 we, we, we can see uh, the negative impact on uh, on mental well-being and career uh, advancements if we have gender segregation and and we we see this throughout uh, the objectives of the RRF uh, some of the member states have actually uh, put measures directly related to that some others still have the opportunity in in, impl in the implementation process uh, so i would really like to, to to conclude this part of my answer by saying that gender equality is not something we can achieve with one instrument but rather with an integrated approach across all sectors and policies uh, but i think that the rrf is is making a, a good step in, in the right direction yeah, it's, it's certainly a powerful tool. I just want to remind our audience that if you'd like to put any of your own questions to our panellists uh, during this discussion, you can do so on the platform. And if you're also interested in other people's questions, you can drop a like on their, their questions and I'll try and put them to our panellists as we go throughout our discussion. So now we'll move to, move to you, Alba. You obviously work in the, uh, the Ministry for Equality in Spain. How have you, as a government across the ministries, looked at this RFF plan that you submitted? And how are you hoping to ensure that the money that you receive uh, is used in a way that can promote gender equality? How are you working with Brussels and how are you working across the ministries in Spain? Uh, well, for us, uh, it is very important that this gender mainstreaming uh, perspective uh, goes all along the, the funds we, we receive. Uh, the government has proposed the recovery and all the, the investments of the fund from a logic that is based in this gender equality as a cross-cutting element. And also, of course, uh, we are thinking about all the questions that are important in this moment as green economies, digitalization, and, and so. Um, in other words, for us, these important funds must our resilience, of course, but they must move forward in the structural changes we need, and we are we knew that were needed before the pandemic. Um, for example, uh, the funds in Spain are going to be executed by the central government, but also by uh, the autonomous governments of our regions. And for this reason, our Women's Institute, which uh, would be the equivalent of the IGE, uh, have worked strongly to, to develop guides that makes easy to these other uh, administrations apply the gender perspective, the gender mainstreaming in the complete development of the projects, not only those that are focused on uh, equality between uh, women and men or, or fighting against gender-based violence, but also 
in others that uh, must take into account this question of equality between women and men, even if we are talking about, I don't know, industrial policies or climate change or wherever. So we hope uh, and we are going to do a big effort as a Ministry of Equality to uh, help all the, our administrations to develop this, this funds in, in this way that reinforce uh, gender equality in all aspects. And uh, I hope we, we can get it because uh, we think that uh, for for years, all the analysis of feminism and experts on these uh, inequalities um, um, were right. And, and the crisis of COVID-19 has shown that as that. So we have the tools, we have the experience on um, gender budgeting, we have the experience in uh, implementing law. And I think we need in this moment uh, that all, all the, the agents, the actors uh, that are going to develop these funds um, are truly concerned with equality as, as, a, as a key to, to face this situation because we strongly think that we need to, to invest more on equality uh, to solve this crisis. Yeah, and I think the reality is, is that as we come, well, hopefully, towards the back end of the pandemic, we are entering into a new, a new sort of world. And, 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 and I think there is a sense that, that we have to operate in a different way. And I think that that sort of transposition of funding and the new way that we look at our governance is going to be really important for, for gender equality. Now, Maria Theresa, let's, let's come to you. Uh, you, you were one of the people that sort of penned the idea of how we would put this recovery fund together. Can you explain the Commission's thinking a little bit, specifically about how the, the money was put together, but also how you want to encourage it to promote gender equality uh, as, as the money starts being dispersed? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jack. So as Mr. Pislaru mentioned, the European Parliament and the Council have established clear criteria in the, in the regulation on how the, about how these plans have to be designed by, by the member states. And once the member state presents the plan, then it is uh, adopted by the, by the Council. And this Council implementing decision is the guidebook for the member state on which kind of reforms and investments that member state will do, what are, which are the objectives for those uh, investments and reforms, and also the time frame for these investments and reforms. Therefore, uh, there is already a jacket for what member states can do or cannot do. And in this regard, uh, the Recovery and Resilience Facility is a performance-based instrument, meaning that uh, it will be only once the member state has implemented these relevant reforms and investments, <laughs> that the funds, the money, as you were saying, will go to the budget of that given member state. So therefore, what the member state has introduced in its recovery and resilience plan is the key element for the implementation. And as I highlighted before, um, we have uh, uh, done a very uh, important exercise in encouraging member states to think about gender equality. And um, uh, there are in the plans uh, targeted measures to promote equality. Uh, Mr. Pislaro mentioned some of them. And also there is a mainstream equality considerations through all the plan, because as highlighted before, uh, um, there are areas such as the green transition and the, and the digital transition in which some of the implementing measures for this uh, digital and green transition can have a key impact in improving equality in the union. And uh, well, I could go, for instance, on digital. What is clear is the participation, no actions to support the participation, the digital inclusion and the participation of uh, women in STEAM and ICT areas, for instance. Also, when we talk about green transition, so there are elements linked to energy efficiency, linked to social housing, green skills, sustainable mobility. So uh, there are key areas also in the labor market area, as Mr. Pislaru also highlighted. Um, we have uh, active labor market policies that can be also addressed specifically to women's integration. We have also uh, key measures, key reforms in terms of reducing uh, gender or pension uh, pay gap, uh, which is 
currently an issue in Europe. And um, we have also measures that uh, can help uh, women to uh, create startups, SMEs, to become entrepreneurs. So all these measures are already in the plans. And therefore, I would encourage um, um, the audience no, uh, of a given member state to check the, well, the, the respective plan of the member state they want to check, and they will find that there is always uh, something that really can help in supporting this uh, union of equality. Thank you. Thank you. So turning now back to you, Dr. Natasha Azapard in Muscat. Um, there is money going out here. I wonder if you, from the WHO's perspective, can perhaps explain where money and funds can be used best to improve gender equality. How, where's the sort of, for want of a better term, sort of low-hanging fruit where you can fund projects in order to improve things more quickly and, and more broadly? Thank you very much. And I'd like to start by saying that as the WHO, Regional Office for Europe, through our country offices, we are always very willing to support countries, even as they have been preparing their plans for this important funding that has been made available by the EU for the EU countries and also funding schemes that are being made available also through um, the, for the neighbourhood countries too. And indeed, of course, we are really pleased to see that health has become a main priority in these plans. But we always are uh, uh, sounding a cautionary note that it's not enough to invest in infrastructure, in hospitals, in digital infrastructure. So anybody who comes to WHO is definitely going to find from our end a strong plea for support and investment in the health workforce, in primary healthcare, in mental health. And in all of these areas, it will make a difference to women, particularly to women in the health workforce. Some practical examples. We really need to focus on upskilling the digital literacy of our health workforce. We can't just invest in digital infrastructure, um, sometimes I like to say developed by young men to be used by middle-aged women in the health workforce. Of course, it's just an, a, a very practical example. We need to be thinking of really um, ways in which we can improve the skills of our health workforce, and that is one of them. Secondly, we are making a strong call for improvement on data, on health workforce data, gender disaggregated data. Many countries still are unable to have a real snapshot of who the health workforce is, what they are doing, what skills they have, when they're about to retire. And uh, I think that we really need to work together in order to invest in the data systems. Finally, we need to invest in leadership. We need to ensure that again, when we are putting huge sums of money into health infrastructure, there is a strong component which is about health leadership. As WHO, for example, when we have just adopted two resolutions at our regional committee on primary health care, on mental health, we commit as a regional office to invest in leadership programs. You can rest assured that we do our utmost to ensure that even member state nominations fairly represent the health workforce, which, as we know, is predominantly made up of women. So I think in a nutshell, um, uh, what I would like to say is that please come to us and please um, send member states where we have country offices to us and we are very happy and willing to partner to ensure that the huge sums of money that are being invested can really go where they can make a difference to invest in the health workforce and this will also pay dividends in bridging gender inequalities. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, we do have some questions coming in from our audience, and I'll start putting them to our panelists. I'll encourage everybody who's watching us to continue dropping your questions in through the platform or, and liking other people's questions if you would like them uh, to, to be answered. So one of the questions that we, we have in um, is regarding um, the sort of opposition of including gender equality. I, I think actually 
perhaps we, we, can, we can come to you, Alba, on this if you're, if you're able to answer this question. The question being, do you see opposition to the inclusion of gender in the spending um, of recovery mo money, either among decision makers or among the general public? Is there opposition to, to, to sort of promoting gender equality through this? Uh, thank you. Well, we, we can consider that there is some opposition uh, to this inclusion of gender equality uh, in this process of the recovery funds, but not only in this process of, of the funds. And for us, it's one of the um, principal obstacles we face uh, to develop our policies and, and to, to face this uh, recovery. Uh, we think there's a kind of social climate that it's promoted maybe by some uh, political parties that questions all this um, gender equality, fight against uh, gender-based violence, even that uh, questions uh, uh, the rights of women in general or the LGBTI community. So um, we are uh, worried and we are concerned with this question because we think that uh, it not only encourages a kind of hate speech and um, against uh, these groups or against feminism or women, but um, also makes uh, difficult develop the public policies we need to, to recover. Uh, we are, of course, um, very very concerned with this and and we want to face it um, we are not scared of, of that but it's a problem because if we think that uh, equality between women and men that gender perspective are key issues of of the union uh, of our way to see um, our links uh, that are in our laws and our in our funding um, questions we, we need to to work together and work strong to face this uh, this question and to make make sure we are uh, based on human rights, based on gender equality, and with our views on, on these um, fundamental rights that we, we need to, to recover to with this process after the pandemic. Dragos, I wonder if I can ask you how, uh, how this can be countered. How can politicians like yourself uh, deal with these sort of opposition voices in order to ensure that we progress? Yeah, I, I mean, this is not necessarily a question of opposition. I think that there are structural barriers, um, you know, you know, for women actually facing to politics, and and you have a vicious circle. If you have the political landscape dominated by male, then uh, the the problem is that it's not necessarily an opposition, but it's uh, you know ignorance to to, to a very large extent. Uh, so so you have the situation in which I I, I don't feel that the government is actually. You, you know, uh, up to the opposition towards uh, having more gender equality, but it's 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 a question of ignorance to, to a very very large extent, and the social historical context made it quite difficult right now. I think mean, you have enough barriers to, for women to get into politics, and if politics is going to be biased towards that, then you know uh, it, it will not have the the natural tendency to alleviate the the, the difference and the gaps. So so that's actually I think that. The, the, the more more honest answer. So, if we would like to get um, more gender balance measures into the RRFs in the future, we need more women in politics. <laughs> so that's a, in decision making, generally speaking, in politics uh, specifically. That's that's uh, that's how I I think that that things are looking right now. Yeah, it's true. All, pretty much all scientific research shows that better gender equality makes societies you know economically better happier people uh, it's, it's 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 sort of clear science uh, nowadays um so we've got another question i think this will probably be for you maria, maria Teresa. um it, as it was mentioned the majority of eu healthcare workers and essential workers are women uh, yet it's not reflected in leadership positions in the health field. What do you think, what, in, what incentives can be used to achieve gender balance in those fields? I mean, I know you work on, the, on obviously the, the RFF, but are there other incentives that can be used? Well, as I, I tried to stress before, um, the RRF, Recovery and Resilience Facility, deals with investments, but also with reforms. And reforms are key. And uh, uh, here uh, it's clear that uh, there can be incentives to uh, provide uh, kind of uh, reductions of elimination of the gender pay gap, um, better pension systems in order for women that 
for family reasons, might decide to break career, not to be penalized. Um, so this applies to all sectors, but uh, also to, to health sectors. So for women to have uh, um, also, uh, and men, uh, more uh, childcare and long-term care um, facilities to help in the family uh, responsibilities. Uh, so it's, it's a question of uh, um, having more access to all the relevant services, having a good legal framework, and then pushing uh, really uh, women, as mentioned by several of the panelists, to uh, more leadership uh, uh, positions. And if I, if I may, I like to also uh, following the previous um, questions, no? I would like to quote uh, two sentences that President von der Leyen uh, introduced in her political guidelines no? about uh, uh, equal uh, gender equality. So what she, she said was, in business, politics, and society as a whole, we can only reach our full potential if we use all of our talent and diversity. Using only half of the population, half of the ideas, or half of the energy is not good enough. And this is at all levels, in all areas, and, and it's key. So it's something that we have to have all in mind and to preach around in order to make this shift, this change in terms of uh, reforms, legal reforms are necessary, but also in terms of uh, appropriate investments. Thank you. Maria Theresa, I want to stay with you just quickly. You, you've looked through a lot of these plans already. Are you happy? Are you feeling content that the plans that have been submitted by the member states are going to benefit gender equality? Are you feeling confident about that or do you still have worries? Well, we, I, I can tell you personally, I would have liked to see more of specifically targeted measures related to uh, gender equality. It is true, as I highlighted before, that um, there are uh, country-specific recommendations that have been addressed to specific member states and not to all member states on gender equality. And um, so this European semester process that we will resume soon uh, can be an exercise, uh, in, an initiative in order to really try to achieve more uh, in, the, in the member states context. Concerning the plans themselves, well, so member states were designing the plans, so we have the measures they have agreed uh, to have in. But as I uh, mentioned in my introductory uh, message, we have some tools in the plan, in the recovery and resilience facility, that will help uh, monitoring in a very transparent way uh, the process. These are these reporting tools that will help us to monitor the impact of the RRF. And there are some of these common indicators specifically related to uh, gender equality elements. So we will see also a progress in terms of the implementation that will help also um, we hope, uh, with all these scoreboards and these measures, to create a, a bit of peer pressure uh, with regard to how member states uh, are implementing their plans. But as said before, there is still a lot to be done. And in terms of the implementation, it's key that civil society, NGOs, and of course, the governments, uh, they take the right actions in order to achieve the goals that we want all to, to see. Thank you. Cheers. So now we'll move on to you, Natasha, because we've got a question from the, from the audience that specifically is, is about the WHO. Uh, the question is, could the WHO or other actors compare Europe with the rest of the world? Do other global payers also pay attention to gender equality recovery? Or is the EU sort of the example for here? I mean, I think we can be proud in Europe, essentially, that uh, while we haven't reached gender equality, we are we probably do better than a lot of other parts of the world. But I wonder, do you think Europe needs to be the sort of beacon on this? And what happens if, if, that, doesn't, if that isn't the case? Let me start by saying the WHO, of course, as a UN agency, very much considers that health is a human right and that where you have gender inequalities, that right is very much compromised. So in all our work across the six regional offices of WHO, we have important programs that really put gender on the agenda. 
I would also like to say that I really appreciate the efforts that have been done by the European Union over the years and that continue to be done to ensure that gender rights um, remain at the forefront. But I very much caution against complacency. And here, perhaps, I would like also to talk a little bit about blind spots linking to something that previous speakers have spoken about. What do I mean? There are two types of blind spots. There are the blind spots, as the panelists pointed out, that arise from ignorance. And this is why it is so important to ensure that women are around the table where the key decisions are being taken. And I think we actually have emerging evidence that shows that where women were in the driving seat, um, really taking decisions at the heart of the pandemic, they were able to take good decisions based on science, taking a wider view also of the health impact of the pandemic, not only looking at the infectious disease epidemiology figures, but looking at monitoring the wider health impacts of the population, mental health, for example, ensuring delivery of continued services. This is all extremely important. The second blind spot that arises, and this is where again I sound a note of caution, is that sometimes we measure that what we are able to measure, and we don't measure what is invisible. So let me take a very practical example. One of the key statistics that we have measured during the COVID pandemic, because of course it is an ultimate statistic, a devastating statistic, is mortality. And the figures tell us that more men are likely to die from COVID. But this is the tip of the iceberg. If we start to dig deeper, if we really start to be able to measure and capture the true burden, the long-term burden, then we start to see a different picture emerging, particularly, for example, when we look at mental health impacts, when we look at mental health impacts in young girls and women, where we are sitting on a twin pandemic, which is very, very worrying for us. So I agree with you that Europe has done a lot. It's not only important for Europe, in order to join this panel, I just left another meeting where we were talking to our counterparts in the US. And I can tell you that they are also very much interested in ensuring that gender equality is on the agenda. We continue to work with other regions in Europe. Of course, Europe can and must continue to uphold the values that we cherish so much and to promote these. But I would sound a, a cautionary note on being too self-congratulating. I think now is the time to step up, to redouble, to intensify our efforts and to be aware of any data gaps where we may not be capturing and really making the invisible visible, which was again one of the key recommendations made in the Monty report. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this index is obviously so important as a source of data surrounding gender inequalities and gender equality. But as you, as you were saying, there are huge data gaps around uh, lots of different levels of equality across the European Union and around the world. And, and they're going to have to be filled before, before we, we can really know the extent of everything that's going on. I wonder, turning uh, to you, Dragos, uh, obviously you represent uh, your constituents in Romania, but obviously broader, uh, the broader European Union as well. What do you think citizens expect from you uh, and from the European Union's institutions in dealing with gender inequality? Do they see the European Union uh, as the place where this can perhaps be resolved? Or, or do you think it, it, it happens or on a more local level, even if the money is coming out of Brussels? I mean, well, I, I do believe that, uh, I mean, Romania is one of the most pro-European uh, uh, member states in terms of, you know, um, how we think that the European project is developing and uh, looking uh, at Europe uh, as, a, as a source of you know strengthening democracy and and you know social economic development, 
And I mean, obviously, if we look at the, the treaty on the function of the European Union, Article 8, uh, and we look at the fact that the EU has a gender equality strategy and the fact that it has been pushing uh, um, since the uh, EU accession of Romania uh, to, to, to be aware of, of this issue of gender equality, I think that indeed Romanians, as I, I will dare to say, uh, citizens from the other member states are looking at the European Union as a source of uh, redressing this uh, this issue of gender equality. Um, now, I, I I would actually love like to, to to draw attention on some of the structural problems that we are facing in Romania. We we do have, unfortunately, um, uh, you know, according to the Europa Index, um, you know, uh, a significant level of deprivation and poverty in Romania. So the level of vulnerability of almost one third of the of the citizens in Romania is really is really big and and it is is actually making things even more difficult to to women that are in vulnerability uh, so that's the main dimension that it's adding up uh, upon all the other dimensions that have been discussing here uh, I've mentioned a little bit earlier the the barriers and the you know uh, structural barriers that that women are facing in when when they would like to enter into politics um, and, and, and that's uh, that's another thing that uh, uh, women back home in Romania are expecting to see, um, you know, moved. And, uh, you know, this area of access to political power, um, if we um, if we are actually looking at the index and, and, and the situation, we see that uh, Romania actually has a, a big gap there. Um, the idea of adoption of, of the gender quotas is, an, is actually quite interesting as a model and would, would be something that, uh, that R Romanian women will, will be thinking of. One last idea that I think is it's quite important. There are areas where Romania is actually not doing too bad. I mean, for instance, right now we have in the parliament the pay transparency um, legislation that we are working at, and Romania is one of the uh, you know countries that are um, doing quite well in terms of the differences in between uh, um, salaries paid. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, from a structural point of view, uh, Romania has a lot of things to do, and I think that the index has has helped uh, the politician and policymakers in Romania to realize the gap even uh, even clearly. Yeah? So, so that uh, that's why I think that this initiative of uh, e EIGI, uh, EIG is actually very very important. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, so a question, a question for you, Alba. I think this is probably a relevant question for you because of Spain being a sort of big member state, both sort of land mass and, and in, in population. The question is, women living, living in rural or remote areas are disadvantaged, not only in relation to men, but also in relation to urban women. And that's the reality. They face additional challenges due to in, in, inadequate prov provisions of social services, including education, health, and insufficient digital infrastructure in some rural and remote areas. Do you believe that the EU should make an effort to support those women? What do you do as a government? Because, uh, you know, women living f sort of off the beaten track in rural farming areas do are disadvantaged. I wonder if you can explain what the Spanish government's thinking and how you think the EU could help. Thank you. Uh, well, of course, the, the women living in rural areas, which in fact are the, the, the most in the country apart from the cities, face uh, different problems and, and we, we consider that it's due because uh, public services are not so developed in rural areas. And if we think how Spain deal with the last economical crisis in uh, 10 years ago, um, it was with uh, strong cuts on those public services of health, um, education and care, which is one of the big uh, issues now. So if you live um, in a countryside, uh, you don't have maybe uh, transport, you don't have maybe uh, childhood uh, care or education from zero to three years or zero to six years. Uh, so what we are facing now is the way in which all the policies uh, we uh, we make from the government and also uh, from the Ministry of, of Equality uh, has also this perspective of, of rural, of the whole territory. And we are working strongly, uh, for example, um, fighting against, against gender-based violence, which is also a problem in, in areas in which maybe you don't have all the services, the police, uh, um, the medical service you, you have on the cities. And we are doing so uh, 
working strongly with organizations that work with, with women and that uh, work with uh, those perspectives. For example, with the recovery funds, um, we are developing a, a big plan against this uh, gender-based violence, but not only uh, against all the violence against women. Uh, I'm, I'm talking, for example, about sexual violence. So uh, we are uh, developing what we are called uh, crisis centers for, for victims in all the country uh, that now we, we have only in, in a couple of cities. And we are also improving all our services and tools to fight against this violence. Um, I'm thinking about the phone, the uh, 016 uh, phone number that helps victims. We are improving the service. Uh, we are digitalizing also um, all of, of the of, um, the services that you can find on, on our official web pages. We are uh, developing more the technologies that um, control abusers. We are extending the um, the tools we had from 15 years ago to fight against uh, gender-based violence to all violence against women because it's a way for us very important to um, to also uh, fulfill the Istanbul Convention which is very important to Spain and of course uh, all the, the policies not only uh, fighting against gender-based violence but also improving care services uh, not only for children but also for elderly people which are very important in the Spanish project, uh, this uh, care economy, these investments, are thinking about women not only in cities but in the whole country because we think that it's the future and, and we need to face it as a, as a whole thing and not only thinking about uh, the privileged spaces of, of cities with more public resources. Thank you. So we've had one more question, uh, another one from the audience that I'll try to put to, to a few of you. I think this is a, an important one that we look probably to the future. Coming to you, uh, Natasha, uh, the question is, how do you see the future of the EU and the world as a whole uh, after the different effects of COVID-19? Are, are you positive? I, I know you've, you've expressed caution, but how do, you, how do you see us going forward out of this? Thank you, Jack. And I, I refer again to uh, the report for the, from the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development, which is very much a future-looking report, and which makes it very clear that we need to make some important decisions about where our future priorities will lie. So I think what we are seeing at the moment is of course, we are sitting again on a wave where numbers are rising inexorably across the European region and we are bracing ourselves again, unfortunately, for what could be a tough winter. But we need to look beyond and we, need, we can't wait for this to be over to look beyond. We have to start from now. And the EU funding is really going to make a difference to a number of, of countries to really start this journey. So it's about have we learned the lessons? Are we going to repeat the mistakes that happened after the financial crisis a decade ago and decide that, oh, well, health is not a big priority? Um, we hear sometimes um, already with disappointment that health has eaten up so many resources because of the pandemic. It's time to focus elsewhere. And I think what our people are telling us is that they want us to focus on their health and well-being because we are, given, we are being given a wake-up call, a second opportunity to really refocus and rethink and reimagine what we want Europe to look like for the young generation, what their priorities are what we want the world to look like. So we link this very much to what the next threat will be. Will it be AMR? Is it climate change, which is with us already? And these are not unrelated problems. So we have actually recharted and remapped what we consider are the determinants of health in the 21st century. And this is rather a crowded slide which means also that it's a rather crowded space, which means that we are getting to the point where we wanted to get to of really a health and all policies approach where all the other sectors realize that it's not a competition between health and the economy, but that good health and well-being is really a lever for economic growth. So let me say that I think if our leaders 
really take the time to learn the lessons and to prioritize what people, particularly our young generation and younger women, think is important. And here we know it's about work-life balance. We see that a number of people are not considering returning to jobs that do not offer the right facilities for work-life balance, that the trust that was earned during remote working during the pandemic needs to be maintained as we go forward. That we need to find ways in order to recognize that uh, our educational um, uh, losses over the past months need to be supported and regained going forward. That the acute mental health problems cannot um, become, we cannot afford that they become chronic problems and that we have a lost generation. Mm. So I think what we are seeing is that health at the moment is still and really at the top of the political agenda, but we have to seize the moment to ensure that this money that is being invested makes a difference. And here again, as WHO, we are making a strong plea, for example, mm. that this money is used to be invested in primary health community facilities. You were speaking yeah. earlier about remote regions. We are seeing so many elderly people in rural areas being left behind. Yeah. We need to make sure that our digital health investments reach them. So the tools are there. Yeah. We've learned the lessons, we've compiled the evidence, and it's up to us to seize the moment to make a difference, I would say. A, a start warning. Thank you so much. I'm very sad to say that that's the end of our panel there. We are running out of time. So I'd like to say a big thank you to Dragos Pizlaro, a member of the European Parliament, to Alba gonzalez Sanz from the Spanish Ministry for Equality, to Maria Teresa Fabregas Fernandez from the European Commission, and to Dr. Natasha Azapardi Muscat from the WHO Regional Office for Europe. Really great talking to you all and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. So we will, we will now head off for a short break, after which we will return when we will join our parallel sessions. If you're on the platform, you can continue to start asking your questions. I encourage you, before you head off to the break, to decide which of the three parallel sessions you want to join. The first one will be with me here in Brussels, what impact COVID-19 has had on health and gender equality. The second, section, uh, the second session will be with Raza uh, in Vilnius, and that will be on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And the third session will be with Alexandrina, also in Vilnius, um, who will talk about mental health. There are obviously a big set of uh, uh, panels and a, a differing set of subjects. Also, during the break, you can use the meet and match function on the platform that will allow you to meet with other participants who are joining the event today. And also, if, if you don't fancy doing that, you can look through some of the, some of the, the uh, app tools that are on there. There is a few wellness videos. You can do some meditation, perhaps a little bit of sort of uh, static yoga as well. So take a look at that. Continue to use the hashtag E-I-G-E-I-N-D-E-X, I get index, uh, for all your conversations online. And we'll see you in the parallel sessions after the break.
Hello there and welcome back to the main studio for the launch of the Gender Equality Index for 2021. I hope you enjoyed the other two parallel sessions that were hosted by Raza and Alexandrina from Vilnius or if you were here with us in the room. We are now going to start uh, wrapping up this event. Obviously the results are out. The first thing that we're going to do is to hear a, a short statement from Kathleen Schess who is a hung Hungarian MEP with the Renew Europe group and uh, she, uh, she made this statement. Thank you Jack for the introduction. The Gender Equality Index has been a really invaluable tool for policy making. I thank Director Cardin Schill and all the experts who worked on it. As an MEP, let me share a few thoughts about how we should rely on this tool and link it to our legislative priorities. The index gives us the comparative data and the research-based evidence on the progress each member state made in gender equality. It is an uncomfortable subject, but looking at the index, we clearly see a union that is divided. We see serious disparities within the EU. Simply put, the opportunities and rights of women are dramatically different based on the member state they were born in. They are unequal in their access to political power, in their labor market chances, even in their safety and security. This is a painful reality we know very well. Europe is one of the richest regions of the world and we still have women skipping work or school because they cannot afford menstrual hygiene products. I strongly believe this is unjust. And the EU has a lot to do with here. To overcome these disparities, one of the most powerful tools we have is our budget. And let me start with a concrete example from my work in the Regional Development Committee. Um, I come from Hungary, a member state that has a lot of catching up to do. Based on the index, we are second to last in our overall score. As I started my committee work, I was very disappointed to learn that these insights are not tied to our development priorities. In my view, it would only make sense that those member states with shortcomings in gender equality should be the ones allocating the highest share of EU development funds towards these goals. But what we see is the contrary. Usually member states lagging behind in the measured outcomes are also the ones lagging behind in budget allocations to gender equality. This is one area where I would like to see significant progress. As we just heard, the COVID crisis adds extra urgency to our work. The EU is set to administer a historic recovery fund. This is our common economic response to the pandemic and it needs to have a strong gender dimension. But because the crisis affected women disproportionately, let's just think of women who have been struggling to work remotely while taking care of children or elderly family members. Think of women in the service sectors who lost their jobs or women who have been logged off with their abusers for months. That's why the European Parliament has been fighting for a gendered perspective to the crisis response. We would have liked to see more commitments, but I still think we achieved some important breakthroughs and many national recovery plans now contain gender-related targets. And the findings presented here confirm that Parliament's priorities were right. The crisis did indeed exacerbate gender equality. We need to continue on this path and we need to make sure these targets and milestones are properly enforced. What I can pledge to you is that Parliament will be there every step of the way to monitor that and calling out shortcomings in implementation. And let me conclude by this. The index reminds us that our progress achieved in the field of women's security is painfully inadequate. It is truly a shame that we have governments within the Union who openly campaign against the Istanbul Convention to stop domestic violence. They say it's against their values, as if violence could ever be a value. Parliament will keep fighting for the EU level ratification of the Istanbul Convention. I thank you again for your great work on the Gender Equality Index, and thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much to Kathleen for sending us that video. Now, as a final closing remark, we're going to hear from Carly and Sheila, who is the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. She's going to give us her final thoughts as we start to wrap up this event.
Dear participants, today we heard that if we continue at the current rate of progress, it will take nearly three generations to achieve gender equality. Yet even that minimal progress is threatened by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is largely because women took up the lion's share of unpaid care work during the pandemic, which affected their ability to work. Women were more likely to be the ones losing income because they were caring for family members and homeschooling their kids. Let's remember that while this work does not show up in countries' balance sheets, it has economic value. Children being raised are future taxpayers. Aging parents would otherwise be taken care of by the state. During the pandemic, women were also more impacted by job losses due to the industries in which they work, such as retail and hospitality. They have also been slower to regain jobs they lost. Unfortunately, as women are more likely to be in insecure work than men are, they have also been less eligible for government support during the pandemic. All these elements and more make it critical that our policymakers take gender into account when putting together their pandemic recovering strategies. Otherwise, there is a risk that we deepen women's economic inequality with men. I don't need to tell you that less economic power means less power in all aspects of life. From being able to leave an abusive relationship to being able to take care of one's health. And that brings me, of course, to this year's special focus on health. I mentioned in my opening words that the Gender Equality Index is about analyzing our current situation so that we can get an approximation of what the future will look like. We learned so much today about what the future might look like in the wake of the virus. Over the 38 million people who have been infected by COVID in the EU, too many have lost their lives and many are facing long-term health consequences. Long COVID in particular is having a worrying impact. Health inequality has gotten worse, with many people struggling to access the health services they need. We have a looming mental health crisis and a domestic violence epidemic to deal with. We have a drop in birth rates, which is quite dramatic in some countries. If this has a longer term impact on our demography, we could be facing some unpleasant economic and political consequences. We have poor working conditions and staff shortages in the health and social care sector. If we are serious about building back better after the pandemic, we will need proper long-term investment in this sector to support our aging societies. But as we are looking forward, I don't want to be unnecessarily negative. In the European Union, we have solid commitments to gender equality. We have gender equality written into our founding treaties. We have a gender equality strategy to guide us until 2025. We have a gender equality body in every EU member state, as well as energetic civil society organizations who campaign for change and brilliant academics who highlight the most important issues for us to fix. Thank you to all of you who joined us today. At AIGE, we have so many tools to help you achieve equality in your country. Of course, we have the index, which will reflect the impact of the pandemic in its course next year. But we also have some tools that will be particularly useful for countries spending European recovery money. We have a gender budgeting toolkit, 
available in all EU languages. Soon, we will have a toolkit to help countries allocate public procurement tenders in a way that benefits both women and men. We have certainly managed to make the case for why gender has to be at the center of our pandemic recovery. We have the tools we need to make it a reality. Now, all we need is political will. Thank you. So with that, it's time to wrap our, up our event. Thank you so much to Carleen and to all of our panelists who've joined us and spoken throughout this event, to Raza and Alexandrina, who've hosted the parallel sessions as well in Vilnius. We have the data, some data now, obviously about gender equality. We have the index for this year. So I can only encourage everybody to get onto the website and find out more about the spe specifics of the data that we now have to make sure that when we come back and release this index again in 2022, that the numbers and the gains are bigger than they have been this year. That's the, in the intention, obviously. Whether you are a member of civil, civil society, an NGO, a policy maker, a journalist, uh, you now have the opportunity to join our Ask the Expert session. That will be available uh, for the next hour after we wrap up this event where you can speak to one of IGA's experts and get your questions answered directly for more specific information. As I say, I'd like to thank all the panelists, all the, uh, the technical staff that have allowed us to continue with this event and to everybody who has joined us and to participated throughout this morning and into this afternoon. It's been an honour to be able to host this uh, and to be part of what is a really, really important day uh, where we find out exactly what's going on with gender inequality, equality in the European Union. Thanks for being with us. Uh, continue the conversation online using the hashtag IGA Index. And, uh, and thank you again to everybody who's participated. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>